Cynthia, I see you and I just smile because you're one of my favorite people in the world. And I just think you're so bright and I think you are so smart. And when it comes to college and college readiness and life, you are just terrific. Do you do you know all these things about you? Well, I think I aspire to them. It's uh, maybe not as much frequent feedback as I'd like, but I appreciate all of that. And and certainly you were one of my uh, inspirations as well. Well, we've known each other for a long time. I was trying to figure it out. I know <laughs> Naked Roommate came out in 2005 and you, I think you, you, Picked up the book for your UT Dallas class. It might have been at 2006 or 2007. What do you think? Yeah, I think it was earlier. I think it was 2006. Okay. And yeah, when I discovered the book, just, I mean, roaming the shelves in the bookstore. This is the best. And yeah, it was the best. And and it was actually initially, um, you know, a, it was going to be a prize for our student leader training um our student leaders who are going to be in the classroom teaching the first year experience and i this will be fun this will be a great you know incentive for, you know as they go through their exercises and then as i'm reading it i'm thinking i think our freshmen would love this and um decided to make it the the required textbook yeah so the book is the naked roommate and 107 other issues you might run into in college and i wrote this just because I just saw so many students struggled and there wasn't anything really that spoke to students and it captured the voices of students and their stories and facts and stats. And this book was put out. It was, it was Barnes and Noble took a risk and put it out there and, mm -hmm. and Cynthia found it, which you just heard. And then the craziest thing happened. The publisher called me and said, somebody bought, he was like a thousand books or 2000 books or like, <laughs> how many books were there? I mean, we probably had at that time, like, you know, 60 sections of the class and, you know, 20, 25 kids in each class. So yeah. it was so, a lot. Yeah. And Cynthia at the time was teaching, what was the name of the class? Officially Rhetoric 1101. Okay. Um, very, very that's not tricky name. No one has any idea what that <laughs> means. But we weren't in charge of the name yet. But Ret 101 was really like the first year experience class, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Required of every freshman. Right. So. so for those of you who aren't familiar with these types of classes, schools, even as early as the early 2000s, would have some of these, these first year experience classes that try to not only help students to navigate the academic setting, but just life on campus. And at a school like UT Dallas, because... You, not only did you teach the class, Cynthia, at the time, what was your title? So, well, my my official title was Director of Undergraduate Advising, but a big part of that role, my favorite part of that role was to um, essentially be Director of the First Year Experience course. And, you know, I didn't just get to pick the textbook. I got to train instructors, get them excited about it, develop yeah. curriculum. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's intense and it's really interesting because 2005 is a good time. It's, it's, you know, there's, there's some years since then. And today I want to talk about, I want to talk about a lot of things. Uh, I want to talk about your work as an independent educational consultant because you're an mm -hmm. IEC, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So for people who don't know what an IEC is, mm -hmm. uh, Cynthia is going to help you to understand and to get a sense of, do you need an IEC? Because there are so many schools that have so many amazing counselors, mm -hmm. and counseling staffs, and they do such a terrific job. But there are some people who want more help, uh, some people who don't want to be the ones that their kids are accountable to because it's annoying. <laughs> right. It's so annoying. I think yeah. one, of the, one of the most important things you do is you help parents to just not be so annoyed with their kids and, and kids listen to people who have a different frequency. There should be a study. I don't know if you, <laughs> I know you have kids as well. Uh, I know with my kids, like my voice doesn't, doesn't land. <laughs> no, no. Mine too neither. So my own kids, um, were very excited to go to college. They couldn't wait. They were really good students. They, they knew that was a big, exciting time in their life. They wanted all their friends to work with me, you know, on the college planning process. 
But when I mentioned anything to them about college, you know, I got eye rolls and heavy sighs and like they just did not want it to come from me. So yeah, it's definitely, you know, and I've, I've had, you know, parents and their student come to me and said, you know, we used to have such a great close relationship, but you know, this minute we bring up college, it it's not good. And they don't like that tension and they, they want to be able to, and I want them to be able to enjoy the process. This is such an exciting time in their life and, and to have strife in the family and, you know, a college visit turned sour because, you know, mom and dad are trying to tell them important things about it. And, you know, the students just, they feel that as either, you know, pressure or dictating or directing. And it's, it's just not, you know, the, the best source for, for students to get the information. Yeah. I think that's why people like me sometimes, uh, because I can say the same thing that a parent is saying and mm-hmm. Someone will hear me say it and think I'm so smart when the parrot's been saying this for like the past five years. And then yes. oh, Marlon's so brilliant. It's like, no, <laughs> my voice just isn't the same decibel level. Uh, right. It doesn't have the same intonation as your voice because I really think it like lands a different place. So, mm-hmm. so that's a, that's another piece. And, and Cynthia is terrific. And I want to give you all a sense of just our history because – Cynthia, Cynthia and I have gotten to know each other over the years, and, and I really try to bring people on the podcast who I trust and know, and uh, or if I don't know them very well, I really love what they're putting out there. But Cynthia is someone who not only do I know very well, but also have a ton of respect for in terms of your expertise, you know, from running this advising at, at, a, at a highly technical level. A uh, lot of engineers, a lot of computer science majors, mm-hmm. you know, and those students are wired uh, mm-hmm. uh, an interesting way sometimes. <laughs> wired, right, it's a nice way to yes. put it. Yeah, yeah. Right, but in terms of like acclimating, having work-life balance, being able to employ the social and emotional skills that are fundamental when it comes to being successful, like you, you, you have such experience and then what happened is Cynthia and I got to know each other and not only did she use the book as part of her first year experience class for everyone we 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 got talking and we we said listen this this naked roommate book is so helpful let's work together to create a workbook and possibly like a whole first year experience program that focuses on the social the emotional the physical, the the financial a little bit, and the academic. So Cynthia and I worked to create the Naked Roommates First Year Survival Workbook, which which was great. I, I wish, so I think, Cynthia, what happened is, like, the material's fantastic. Like, I'm really proud of it, aren't, aren't you? Oh, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun, and I do think. I, I just have always been such a believer in that, that course and that experience. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's so important, and the the workbook is great. It's not something that we we worked really hard to establish this, and I think it was ahead of its time, more than anything. And um, now, because of the statistics and and because of just this, we, we know you know two thirds of students struggle, and more than half feel hopeless and lonely, and the statistics have become increasingly worse in terms of mental health and wellness. So, you know, I think there's there's more there's more room for that than ever. I've been doing my best first year coaching program. That's kind of where I've taken things over the over the past several years. Um and then Cynthia and I, we did this project together and she would use some of the exercises in her class and we developed some some really cool curriculum and I, I'm still really proud and excited about it all. Then Cynthia uh Cynthia then left higher ed and you know, why don't you just tell us, because I think you're better off telling your own story than me, but it's, I, I love I love what you've done. I love where you are, but just kind of give us a, just like, you know, two seconds. Okay. Okay. Two seconds, but I'm going to, before that, I want to kind of just use your momentum here yep. on, you know, the kind of the impetus for that uh, guidebook. And then even sort of, I think what you're doing right now, you know, the naked roommate, I remember you used this phrase to me, the naked roommate was other people's stories. The workbook makes it 
each individual student's stories. And I, and I think that that's kind of, since that time, how you've developed what you're doing, I think, yeah. is, is really making it personal. You can read everything about what other people have experienced and done, but, you know, relating it to yourself. And, and my background, so my background is I'm a developmental psychologist by um, education. And of course, that's that's a great field for always being able to re relate things, you know, to the person's experience. But UT Dallas was a, a, an amazing time in my life. I loved running that program, as well as the other roles that I had there. Um, unfortunately, the powers that be decided, especially as the university was growing and growing and growing, the individual uh, colleges themselves, like the School of Engineering and Natural Science. They kind of wanted ownership of that class. And so that class um, was going to be taken in a new direction. Um, my role as well, sort of in parallel to that, was really sort of more filled with, I'm just going to say meetings with uh, adults <laughs> rather than being able to work um, as closely with the students as I wanted to. So, um, and, and honestly, just in a random Google search, this is such a quirky story, but I didn't even know that there was such a thing as independent educational consultants and people who work lately with families through that college planning and search and selection application process. I didn't even know, but I was I was Googling around and, and found it um, through the IECA, the Independent Educational Consultants Association. And I think I, like I read the, the main website three times, like, is this for real? Like this just, yeah. it sounded like the perfect role for me you know after at that time i had been in higher ed 20 years and i thought wow this is really getting back to the roots of i think what matters most to me and that is you know working with students directly supporting their parents and families as they go through and plan for one of the most amazing times in their life and being on the other side of that process from okay you know i love first year experience and helping those freshmen make that transition now I can kind of get ahead of that curve and work with students as they're thinking about what's going to matter and, and maybe make that transition smoother through the process of even where they decide to apply and, and go to school. Yeah. Thanks for reminding me of just your education because mm -hmm. the, the, um, the psychology foundation you have and you know, mm -hmm. really being uh, empathetic and understanding mm -hmm. to the student experience like that's i think that's really where we connected mm -hmm. because, because so much of this is emotional and you've touched on it before this should be exciting this should be wonderful and oh, yeah. the other part i love and it was just fun to listen to you share that that background is having the 20 years on college campuses and seeing the real life problems that students are struggling with and also understanding the administrators and understanding the faculty and mm -hmm. and just all the different challenges that everybody's facing on day-to-day -day basis and then taking that thread and this is what i've been focusing on a lot mm -hmm. yeah and and, and Cynthia and i we, we you know we we used to talk a lot and then we kind of went our own direction for a little bit just because of life and we've recently reconnected and i was like oh my gosh like Cynthia, we got to we got to do this in the podcast because you know it's like we're lifelong friends, yeah. and uh, we also really, you know, we, we have a passion for wanting to help. But this idea that the best first year in college starts in high school, the idea that, and I was I'm thinking of doing a program. It's it's kind of tongue in cheek, but it's how to prepare your kindergartner for college. <laughs> I know it sounds ridiculous. No, that's actually like, a real thing. There are people that are consultants just for that process, but <laughs> right, right, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not in my circles, but it's out there. So maybe right. not as tongue in cheek as you think. Well, you know, it's like there's the tongue in cheek part, but then there's there's more of the mindset, the parent mindset. Mm -hmm. And today, I want to touch on, I want to touch on the holistic approach to looking at mm -hmm. college, which is really just a practice for going from one place in life to to another. Really, mm -hmm. really identifying what you want and how to and how to how to develop the life skills to be able to navigate those changes and get what we want and then mm -hmm. i also want to get into some of the, the 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 details of right now we're at a place where students have applied they're getting waitlisted they're getting deferred they're getting rejected you're they're dealing with they don't know what they're going to do and, 
I'm, yeah. I'm happy sharing. We're right now, this is uh, January of 2024. So uh, there's a lot of uncertainty. So I want to clear up some of that as well. And I think it's so helpful for people who aren't familiar with you just to understand your perspective and worldview and what's formed it. So um, it's so cool. It's just fun to, it's fun to talk to you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, isn't that crazy, Cynthia? I do our story i think it's it's a great story and you know again it's i feel so fortunate to you know in you have this person that whenever we talk i'm always inspired you know i always leave and it's like my brain is a buzz with you know ideas and thoughts and yeah. you know finding someone that you can collaborate with so easily successfully but you know one fun you know memory from um you know when we first connected was you know being in my office having my my admin say, you know, huh, I, I have Harlan Cohen on the phone for you. And I was like, no, you don't. I mean, this is a woman that, you know, said she'd bring Johnny Depp to the office. And I'm like, no, you know, you you, you don't. And she's like, yeah, I do. And I remember our first phone call was two hours. Wow. <laughs> talked, that's too long. You know, it, it, was, it was a long time. Luckily, I had the, it was spring, so I didn't have any, yeah. any classes. But, but I, you know, it, I think that just was a testament to, you know, we, I think we talked about finding each other as, you know, this first year experience, right? you know, soulmate, you know, that, that how much that meant to you and the work you had done and yeah. how much that had been important to me. It was huge. I'm so siloed oftentimes, you know, I, I visit all these campuses and I talk mm -hmm. to faculty, staff, parents, administrators, I'll talk to presidents of universities, I'll talk to heads of schools, of independent schools. I'll talk to public schools. Today, just before this call, I was talking to a director of the Gear Up program, uh, an early college readiness program, about ways to support first-gen students and their mm. families. So for me, this curiosity of how can we help and, and mm -hmm. what are the themes that students are dealing with, and to have someone who is on the ground living those experiences who is equally as passionate and, and eventually I got to speak at at UTD Comet Camp. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, that's all the background. Let's get into some answers. Okay. I, I want to get to some practical information and um and help some of our our listeners. So right now, when a student applies to school, we've got more students applying to more schools than ever before. I just want to get into the to what's really hot right now. And when a student hears back from a school and they are deferred, mm -hmm. do you have any students who are deferred this year? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So when a student is deferred, what do you tell them? What do you tell their family? Okay. So, um, and I'm, and I'm disclaimer, I'm not speaking on behalf of any college or university, but the process of deferring students is something that has changed dramatically in, in the last, I would say, five to six, seven years. You know, it used to be what, what a deferral indicated was, you know, a student has applied in an early round, they're reviewed, and very rarely, it was very rare. And, and you know, the school was just like, eh, we're just not sure. You know, we, we, we like you enough, we, we don't want to deny we're just not sure if you, you know, how you're going to, to read relative to everybody else. So, so it really was a very uncommon thing for a student to get a deferral. And it truly meant you're on, we're on the fence about you. And we, we just want to read you once again, not so much anymore. Um, it really isn't. And this is, you know, amped up as the volume of applicants has just skyrocketed. That really started also before COVID. I mean, COVID what changed, the number of applicants was the test optional um, climate, which, you know, there's many good things about that. Um, but as, as students no longer needed a test score to, you know, feel like they were, you know, a competitive applicant, well, golly, you know, let's just try this school and try this school. Well, you know, normal colleges face, you know, just like unprecedented numbers of applications in that early round. You know, again, the, historically, early round was kind of like, well, hey, if you're really on the ball and you can get it in, that helps us with our, you know, reading distribution a bit. Now it's it's a goal, and and I will say it's a goal for my students as well. I just want this this done, but without that test score and and students getting everything in, 
you know, the, the colleges and universities are, you know, going nuts with getting everything read. But beyond that, of course, the big um, issue with all colleges and universities is managing their yield. And, and in a nutshell, that means, you know, if they have 2,000 seats for freshmen, you know, they have to figure out how many can we, spots can we fur because we know not all of the students are going to take those seats, but we want to get as close to as possible, right? So, you know, how do we how do we make sure that when we give one of our valuable spots that there is a good likelihood the student is is going to take it, right? So what's happened, this, this is now, I'd say, a, a strategy in that students who apply early action, when they're looked at, and this can happen both for, I'll probably use it, you know, the state schools is, is probably a better example, but you have a big state school, um, and they have a really strong applicant apply early action from a different state, okay? And they're looking at this fabulous student and, you know, yes, the early round. And here's what they're likely thinking. Or this is probably kind of the new wave of what's happening. They're looking at this incredibly bright student, happens mostly with, you know, stronger students perhaps, where they're like, well, first of all, you know, this student is perhaps very likely to have applied early decision to a school and therefore is already committed somewhere else. And they're strong. They're the, the, they meet the profile of a student that's that's perhaps going to have done that. So it's taking a risk for us to offer them a spot if they're already committed in this early round. Likewise, you know, they're from a state that also has a great public institution. So how likely is you know, you know, another out of state public institution, are their parents going to be to say, well, you can go there instead of here as again, it's a strong student. And they're really kind of hedging their bets. You know, do we think that this student from this state is, is really going to be serious? Are they really serious or are we just cool? Cause we, we won last year's, you know, championship for something. Um, and so a lot of times what they do is they just think, you know what? We're not sure. Again, we, we think they're great, but we're not sure if they'd actually consider us. So we're going to defer that. And of course, deferrals typically require a letter of continued interest or a loci as it's it's called. Um, and so they're just kind of checking. And and I'm sure that it's, it's a very effective strategy for colleges because they are going to eliminate all of those students who are committed through an early decision who have done early action elsewhere and have a favorite that's higher on the list that they already got into. I'm like, okay, I'm not really interested in them anymore. Um, and so it, it does help them, you know, reduce their applicant pool for the regular decision round. But, you know, for students, you know, what happens with, with mine and they're, they love the school and they're excited and they're really bright students and they're just bad. How, how is it that I am, I've been deferred from this college or university. I mean, it's just disheartening no matter what. It's not a denial, but, you know, they had everything in early. They're a sorry oh. student. And so it, it's, but I just tell them, you know, right now it doesn't mean likely, I can't say for sure, but it certainly doesn't mean they're on the fence about your ability to be successful there and that you contribute to campus. It's really about how serious are you? Because you're a bright student, in my case, from the state of Texas, you're you're probably, you know, considering the Texas schools, they're fabulous. Our mom and dad really gonna, you know, let you come here for for out of state tuition and right. all of that. So so I really try to guide them in terms of and I do also say, you know, how serious are you? You know, you might be, you know, shocked and disappointed that you're deferred, but would you really consider the school given where else you've you know, found out you've you've gotten in. And and sometimes they say yes and sometimes they're like, Yeah, no, I don't I don't think I'd go. So Okay. So getting deferred, people interpret it as a form of rejection. You know, I think it, it, it really takes them down a notch. But the way that you frame this is a student can be so exceptional that the school is really uncertain about their level of commitment. So one mm -hmm. way as a tool to gauge their level of commitment is to say, okay, we're going to defer you and we need to know that you're interested. So you need to submit that letter of continued interest. Mm -hmm. And that's something that whenever a student is deferred, they, they need to complete that letter. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. Is that usually? Yeah. 
Okay. And most schools have that. Some schools don't go that far. They just, I mean, and this might be more of the academic piece, but, you know, share fall grades, um, update us on any additional, you know, accomplishments in your extracurriculars or whatever. So when, um, ask, when they're asking people to share those grades, it's not as much looking at the grades as much as looking at the effort that it takes to share the grades. Is that yeah. is that accurate? I would say it's accurate for, you know, and, and not to say that there are no true deferrals of we don't know. So I'm, I'm going to say in some cases, it may be right. that they do need that confirmation that right. we're, we're, the student is still doing well in school and, and we want right. to really look at them. But in terms of that strategy and for many of the students that I think they're just overwhelmed with and how can we, you know, reduce that list to look at and, and see who's really serious. Yes. Are you going to go through the steps that we require, including having your transcript sent again, updating us, and writing that letter as to why you still are right. interested? Because those things really exercise, or they 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 demonstrate a uh, a continued interest mm -hmm. uh, yeah. on the students, and that may be helpful. So mm -hmm. when you have a student who's deferred from a school that they really are interested in, it's kind of it's kind of a bummer because there are many students who really want this school you know maybe it's their number one and they can't mm -hmm. they can't do an ed because they can't make that financial commitment at that point mm -hmm. because right. the ed is really saying an early decision is i'm going to go here and i'm making a a total commitment that if you mm -hmm. accept me then i'm committed um mm -hmm. action's a little bit different right most right. schools now really value the early action early decision they they give away a lot of those slots or reserve a lot of mm -hmm. slots. That's kind of a big mm -hmm. change that happens mm -hmm. in November, typically those deadlines. Regular decision are deadlines that are typically in early January for applications. Mm -hmm. Right. And then, and then those decisions will come out in, um, when people do a regular decision, typically- Usually it's late March, early or April 1st. Right, so late yeah. March and April 1st, and then Typically, May 1st is the deadline to mm -hmm. commit. And given yeah. everything that's happening with the simplified FAFSA this year, there are questions whether or not that May deadline, that May 1st commitment deadline might get pushed. So mm -hmm. we'll, we'll see about that. Yeah. But um, getting back to some of the, the terminology and, and what people can do if they're deferred or waitlisted, what, when yeah. a student is deferred, tell me, do you do you tell them to apply to other schools? Do you tell them, you know, even though you're deferred, I, I think there's a strong likelihood that you'll still get accepted. Yeah. How, how do you, how do you frame it? Okay. So, well, relative to my process, when I work with students, um, by the time deferrals come out, that first wave is, is the earliest is likely around mid December. So, um, my students are done with everything when, you know, my process and, and I do recommend it. I mean, I think that even if you've got an early decision, you know, you don't want to save this heavy duty work, um, you know, for your Thanksgiving break or your winter break. I mean, you know, the more that you can just get that energy, ride that wave of, of being in that application mindset and, you know, just every place that you want to apply, get those apps in early. Um, so that, you know, my students, when they're deferred, again, they may have heard of, you know, heard from some of their early action schools, they may still be waiting on others, but it's typically in this case, not, um, a matter of let's add some more schools to your list. They've, they've got other options. Um, I really, you know, because I can't possibly, um, depending on the school, um, but for the most part, I, I really can't say, you know, I, I think you've got a super chance. It's just a formality. You'll be fine. Um, but I, but I do tell them the story that I just shared with you. I have a write up on that, that I share with my students and my families. So I just want you to understand, um, you know, again, this is one other intricacy of this whole right. process and a process that we all want to quantify. We want to have all those specifics and answers for that we don't have, but right. it's just one more way that, um, because, and this is part of the bigger narrative too, if we get into talking about rejections and, and any students with, you know, applying to highly selective schools where, you know, there is only so much that a student can do. Right. It can be fabulous and whatever, but there are institutional priorities and, 
again, the volume, these colleges and universities, they have just the pick of the litter. And I, I heard one, somebody framed it like this, you know, they get to choose the interesting from among the smart. <laughs> so, and what interesting, what is interesting to one school may be very different from another, but, but that's, again, that's just the scenario we're dealing with. Just so many right. phenomenal students who are turned away. So deferral is kind of one more, um, you know, sort of, uh, result of that that process okay. and for all my students i just do my best to say this is not speaking to how hard you've worked all that you've accomplished or your potential to be successful in college it's right. it's a factor of this institution its popularity this year and their practices okay that's really helpful okay. and um you know if you want to share anything in the show notes uh you know, that write up that you have, oh, okay. I, I'd be happy to include what, whatever you want. Okay. I, mean, I think what you shared is really helpful and it, okay. and it really untangles the personal side. And yes, it's disappointing to not get what you want, but there are so many different factors. So briefly explain to me what being waitlisted means. Okay. Okay. So waitlisted, um, this typically happens. It, it, it typically doesn't happen until the, the regular, um, decision period read. Um, so it's rare that a student would go from early action rate to wait listed. Usually, you know, either they're going to be flat out denied, deferred, and then from the regular, uh, de uh, decision pool, then again, this is all about yield, right? So the school picks its first round of, you know, um, admitted students and realizing that there's always the chance that maybe not enough of them will, you know, enroll to fill their class. They create a wait list of students that are sort of, I'm going to just call it the second tier. You know, you're not good enough to get in this tier, but if we really need your tuition dollars, we will, we will pull from our wait list. Um, and so it's, it's a process of saying, you know, um, again, you're not in. Right. And we have absolutely no, guarantee or degree of certainty as to, or your chances of being called off the wait list. And oftentimes, you know, wait lists, they don't pull from a wait list till mid summer. It could be, right. I had a student once get pulled in mid July um, for a, a mid August start. So that student it's just, you know, we'll, we'll, yeah. what that yeah. student do? Um, well, she went, <laughs> that was years ago. She took it. Um, and, but I have strong feelings about it. Well, and, and the other thing is now more and more schools are asking students um, if they want to accept the spot on the wait list. They, they didn't used to be so proactive. They just said, you're on it. Um, but now they want to, to know if a student wants to be on, again, another, you know, way to, to get rid of those who don't care. So we want to see if you want to be on our wait list and that probably reduces their wait list to, you know, um, at least a you know, a smaller number of students, but right. um, yeah, that's really helpful. So if someone's deferred, they need to complete that letter of continued interest. If mm -hmm. someone is waitlisted, then they might have to respond. The action would be to say, I, yeah. I still want to be on this way. Yeah. And then the part where you said, and I know it's, I know that you don't mean that someone's not good enough. And I just want to like clarify with the waitlist piece, it could be someone's waitlisted because they already have someone who fits your criteria right from right. a particular state and mm -hmm. and the person who meets that criteria or is that demographic decides to go to another school right. uh, and doesn't accept that that um it doesn't commit so right. that student who's equally as good who mm -hmm. maybe the person who read that application was hungry or had a bad morning with their significant other or their kids were driving them nutty and they read yeah. an application and were in a bad state. So they right. decided they're going to wait list that person because they already have someone that meets that demo. Like, like that's the, the whole idea of, of being a second tier. It's, mm -hmm. I think it's so fascinating because when you aren't admitted in the first round, it doesn't mean you aren't as good or exceptional. Right. Right. It's just, there's so many factors. Would, would you agree oh. with that? Oh, Completely. So two, two 
points to to your comment and and absolutely you nailed it so again a big part of you know the term i mentioned earlier institutional priorities so for for what, the more selective uh, a college or university the more these come into play and what that means is college and university has a checklist and and it and it you know is refreshed every year so the powers that be you know before the the new admission cycle say okay Here's what we need in our new freshman class. And that's all demographics from what athletic positions do we need to fill? Or we need a bassoon player for the orchestra and three tubas for the marching band. And and then, you know, where's our student from North Dakota? You know, they all love to say, we have a student from every 50 states, you know, so we got to get our North Dakota kit. So they have these. And and as you, you know, to your point, yes, you know, student, that's where entity student, no matter how stellar they are, they, they cannot but control whether they're, you know, um, kind of the, the first yeah. student from North Dakota or the 18th student, and they only need 17, you know, so, so we don't know. And as you said, that's another point about the wait list. So the reason, you know, they don't prioritize, it's not an order, you applied earlier, so you're going to be the next one off the wait list. It's about who doesn't accept um, a spot in the freshman class, what other student has those demographics, those, you know, checks the same boxes as that student. Now, my comment about you in the second tier, it's a little bit, you know, kind of the way that I, I want students when, when they're thinking about a wait list. And this is a really, it just this is a very meaningful point to me because ideally, you know, you have a lot of options, at least several options for, for your college list. And you know this, Farland. I mean, this is part of the first year experience. There is such a rich, very rich and important experience when you decide on the college you want to go to, right? You know, you look at all your options, you revisit, talk to mom and dad, and like the the process of falling in love again with the school, um, you know, signing up for orientation, getting your housing, going on the portal to chat and get your roommate, it, buying your dorm stuff, you know, I mean, that whole lead up to go into your freshman camp and getting on campus for orientation until your move in day. That's that's such a big part of, of this really incredible experience. And I, I think supporting a student in the in the first year. The wait list has the power to undermine all of that. It, it, taking a spot on a wait list is basically not loving any other school. This is often how students do it. It's not like, okay, I'll be on the wait list and forget about it. You know, because if, if you're like, okay, I'm on their wait list, then they're like, there's a chance, right? There's a chance for, for a school that did not choose them first. And, and, and is, you know, I, I find the, you know, the psyche of adolescence is, is delicate. I mean, you know, for all of us, it could be fragile, but when you're, when you're 17 and 18 and you're trying to navigate this, you know, this, these huge decisions in life and, and your own decision, right? Make your own decision. Do I stay on the wait list? I love the school and they're kind of still giving me a chance. And yet, you know, what we know that it's so important. I, I feel it's so important to find a school that wants you now. Perhaps it's giving you scholarship money that loves you right. <laughs> and is ready to welcome you on campus and, 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 and dive in and engage with that and not put that off, not disengage and not say, Oh, well, okay. Cause you have to enroll in one by right. May 1st. You have to do right. so to just sort of, you know, half heartedly make a choice, but not give yourself emotionally and excitedly over to, you know, to a school because you're hanging yeah. out on somebody's wait list. I just, I don't like that for students. For students, I, I just don't like them missing out and giving the power, you know, to that college right. or university. To, think, to take that away so much of it is the it's the power piece it's mm -hmm. it's i am i am surrendering and giving this school all the power and i don't have as much agency or ownership and i think that's really where the whole college process is so flawed where it's mm -hmm. search selection and scarcity and when there's scarcity <laughs> you don't have the power and mm -hmm. when you continue to put yourself in that place and it's like dating, you know, it's saying <laughs> if, if this doesn't work, if your relationship doesn't work out with these other people, I want you to know, I still want to date you. 
and I'm not going to commit to anyone else, uh, 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 you know, just until you tell me it's no, it's a no. And, right. and right. you know, I don't, I, I discourage students from putting themselves in that place because I think also the emotional transition, the, the social, the physical, the financial, all of those transitions, like you said, mm -hmm. they kind of are put on hold because you're one foot in, one foot out. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so much of success during that first year is, is understanding that process. And, and you know, I, I, in the same breath, if someone understands college is about what do I want? And mm -hmm. if I want something and I can get what I want on five different campuses, then I'm, I'm still in charge. And if one mm -hmm. of the campuses waitlists me because of whatever reason, but I have another school that I'm equally excited about, which, you know, a lot of, not a lot of 17 and 18 year olds can think through it this way. Right. Right. Um, but I know that on each of these campuses, there is going to be a place, a community where I'm going to be welcomed and included simply because I exist. And I know in my mind how I'm going to operate on any campus so that I can set myself up to be successful then that's kind of like the asterisk in, in that wait list uh, mindset. Um, mm -hmm. And this is where, you know, I'm so passionate now about, and I love how we're both in this place of, it's the best college experience starts in high school and it's not even about being the best. Right. I think right. this, this idea of being the best, we we were chatting, uh, Cynthia and I had, had a, a, a call we hadn't talked in, in several years and, and we were talking, and one thing that stuck out that's been echoing in my mind between my ears is, and, and you do a lot with pre-med and, and medical mm -hmm. school. It's like that's also one of your specialties. But you said you could go anywhere, and you can go anywhere. You can go at, to anywhere. Go anywhere from anywhere. Right. You, you can go, go anywhere, anywhere from anywhere. From right. It anywhere. echoed in my head, but I didn't quite, uh, you know. <laughs> oh, it was echoing. I think I said it. <laughs> But you can go anywhere from anywhere. Yes. And I want you to really explain this, not only from someone who does this, you know, who does this professionally, but right. also just as a parent, like explain mm -hmm. this to people because I've had so many experts share this and I just think it doesn't get through people's mind. So to so right. help us to understand this. Okay. Okay. And it's probably the harshest part of my job. Um to, to get the message across. Um, and the fundamental thing is that, you know, college, any college, any accredited college or university anywhere is essentially a set of opportunities. Of course, you have classes to take. They will have clubs and organizations and, um, you know, professors who, do all sorts of things in their lab and, you know, write books and, and whatever it, it, again, whether it's the local state school down the street or the most esteemed, um, college at the time in the university, it, it's a set of opportunities. You can have a student go to any college or university and simply, um, honestly, robotically go to class, be a sponge, you know, regurgitate on the exams and that's it, you know, hide in their dorm room, play video games not engage, um, get a degree. Um, and then you can take any student and put them anywhere and just dive in to learning beyond the classroom. Classroom is one thing, getting to know professors, finding ways to engage deeper with that. Can I do an independent study? Can I get in your lab? Um, you know, develop as a, as a leader or, you know, um, just, you know, advocate in, in a variety of ways, a service. Where I mean, at college campuses as a whole, are they, they talk about themselves. They're communities. They're they're living, breathing communities. There's there's different uh, you know uh, people in different roles and and opportunities. And I guarantee the schools that people have never heard of um, are you know don't make any top lists or ranks or whatever. They are they are putting their efforts, energies, talents, and money into rich, engaging opportunities for students. And that is not something that comes with a name or a reputation or a school that's been around for several hundred years. In fact, the some of the most popular, highly selective name schools 
are are very focused on graduate students. I mean, these are, you know, yes, impressive and world renowned research institutes. Um and and who's in the labs? Who has to be in the labs? Who has to work alongside the the most esteemed professors? It's the graduate students. That's the system. And, you know, of course there are still fabulous institutions, but when you're an undergraduate of 18 or 19, you're not sure what field you want to go into or you think you do, but what do you really know from high school? These are institutions that, you know, there are institutions designed to really create a rich undergraduate experience. And that's so important. And there's such a difference in in how you engage a, a freshman, a first year student, and and what you do with a graduate student. And so you know, and students who have visions of going to medical school or law school or getting their MBA or graduate school or just going out into the workforce, you know, it what matters to admissions in those areas and what matters to employers is what that undergraduate resume looks like. And I guarantee it's beyond the, the transcript and just straight A's. And for medical school, it's more than strong grades and a good MCAT score. Um, you know, there are in, in medical school, they call them the 15 core competencies of, you know, an incoming medical student. And it goes well beyond. They want to know that you've done service. They want to see that you have engaged and, and interacted with people who are very different from you in those underserved populations in a lab, um, that you're a leader that, you know, I mean, so, you know, not every school and certainly not every school that anyone has ever heard of or has to you know, cross their fingers and, you know, wish on, you know, the first start of the right that they can get into, you know, is going to give them that opportunity. And so it doesn't matter where a student goes for their undergraduate degree if they capitalize on those opportunities and use them to develop themselves and accomplish the things they want to accomplish and find those opportunities, create those opportunities, partner with faculty and staff. I guarantee you can you can pave your way to Harvard Medical School or Stanford Law School or get your MBA, you know, wherever you you so choose. And um, and it's just it's understanding what people don't always realize is really what the undergraduate experience is for and what it means and how it it serves to to develop a young person into you know, somebody who will then be, you know, ready for when that next phase is. And, and, and that opportunity, that set of opportunities and their likelihood of developing has nothing to do with the name of a school or how selective it is or anything like that. So I've, I've done some work in Texas. I've worked with Tarleton State University. Um, I'm, I'm, <laughs> and not a lot of people know Tarleton State University. And I work with these student leaders and they are exceptional. And then, you know, I, I work, I see they're working with the administrators. I see they're actively engaged and there's lots of different schools. I work with, um, Eastern Illinois university. Uh, I did a, a, an event there the other day and was blown away with the leadership and the commitment from the faculty and all the opportunities and the diversity. And it was just a really cool environment. So to reinforce this idea that going to a highly selective school for an undergraduate program and 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 it's not it's not essential to be successful in life no no in oh. fact and like i said i'm gonna just i'm gonna put it out there that having a like you mentioned i i have a, a very um uh, strong education in in pre-health and and what it means i served on the health professions executive committee at ut dallas for 10 years and sat alongside um, a former director of UT Southwestern Medical School who admitted students for 10 years to that, you, you know, that institution, f- physicians and all sorts of experts in the area to learn what medical schools are looking for. And I can just tell you, I mean, there's so much you have to do as a student beyond do well in class that, again, some of the, the most selective institutions don't enable students to do that. And whether it could be just the academic demand is is so um, strong. And again, that's quality, it's yeah. demand, it's pressure, it's competition, it's 
time required to keep up and feel and do what you have to do to get an A. Um, it, sometimes there's just no room and no time. Um, it's also, you know, much harder if nearly impossible to get a position in somebody's lab. And, you know, you're applying to medical school, for example, and, and law school would be the same, junior year of college. So by the time you're filling out that application, spring of junior year, you have only had essentially two years in college to have had these incredibly rich experiences. So again, while there's some larger institutions and very research focused that, okay, by the time you're a junior or senior, you might have lab opportunities, but for med students and uh, applicants and law school applicants, and that's too late, you know, that is too late. But going to a college or university where freshman year, you can get in a lab and you're not cleaning test tubes, you are, you know, really engaged in what's happening and understanding my, you know, scientific method and, and doing the research. There are schools where it's common for students to co-author papers, present at conferences alongside their professors um, as undergraduates. Again, so that these are things that they put on their medical school application or law school application. I mean, they're just... And, and they're institutions designed to do that. They are undergraduate-focused institutions. And, and I'm, I'm sharing this not to say that, uh, you know, Harvard would be a bust if you want to go to medical school, but I, you know, it is a lot harder to become as strong and competitive a medical school applicant um, for, for a majority of students, you know, in that environment as opposed to a place that, that nurtures that and, and expects students to take advantage of those things. So the hack is if you could go to a school that's a research institute and you also, they'll probably give you a lot of money. You can mm -hmm. be part of an honors program if you want. You can have access to some of the researchers. You can ask students when you get to work in a lab, how competitive it is it to work mm -hmm. in a lab? Mm -hmm. And then you can also see, and this is another big question that I think a lot of students don't ask and don't think about when looking at some of these more selective schools is, to be involved in clubs and activities and organizations, do you have access as a first-year student or a second-year student? Because I know at many of the most selective schools, you have to apply once you're in the school mm -hmm. to be part of a club or org. You have to interview. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to be invited. So mm -hmm. if you're a student who's overwhelmed and exhausted or a parent who sees, my kid is just, you know, they, they are just not they're not balanced to be exhausted and overwhelmed and overtired so that you can get into a school where you can be exhausted and overwhelmed and <laughs> overtired to live a life you're exhausted and overwhelmed and overtired. What is the end game? And the end game is being exhausted, overwhelmed and over overtired yeah. where you can take a gap year. That's one option. You can also look and see where can I be the best or have a better chance of being at the top of my class mm -hmm. and be surrounded by exceptional, amazing people and be part of an alumni network and mm -hmm. be able to have access to graduate programs that are going to look at me as, as being unique. Let me ask you this, Cynthia. When, mm -hmm. And I was talking to a student at a, I was at a Chicago Fire hockey or Chicago Fire soccer game. Sorry, I was thinking of hockey. <laughs> okay. The Blackhawks were so terrible this year and just listening to a report. But um, I, was sit I was talking to a kid who goes to the University of Chicago and he graduated from Yale and he was doing some type of quantum physics or so something <laughs> that I could barely even comprehend. And I was asking him, I was saying, you know, if you are in the middle or bottom of your class at a highly selective school, how does that play into your advancement as opposed to being at the top of your class at a school that isn't from this pool of highly selective schools? You know, how do how do programs, med school programs, law school programs, how do they look at that when populating their graduate programs? Well, it's so there's this wonderful, um, I think it's on YouTube, this wonderful talk um, by Malcolm Gladwell. He's one of my favorite authors. Um, and I think I think if you Google on YouTube, like, why did I choose to talk here? He, he presents this at a Google conference and he's actually shown, you know, studies that when you are, because I use the term big fish in a small pond for a lot of my students, my top bright students and their parents want them to go to these, you know, magical um, name schools. And I'm like, you know, first of all, 
you know, we're, we're all aware, and my, my professor in graduate school looked at kind of our, our self-concept relative to who our, our peer group is. You know, we, we all look at ourselves and see ourselves different relative to who we're surrounded by. So when you're a student at a highly selective school that, you know, if you're dealing with, you know, just these outstanding, exceptional, intellectual students, and, it, you know, if you get in, you are of their caliber, but if you are in a position to, to, to view yourself as not being at the top and struggling and everyone seems smarter than you or, or more capable or easy, that is a deterrent to motivation, okay? That, you, I mean, you just kind of feel like, why? You know, I, I'm just not going to be as good. I'm not going to, you know, you know, progress as much. I, I can't compete. You know, you may still be in Harvard, but if you are a low end of your class, you know, there's a struggle there. There's a mental struggle and, and it may not be a, an objective one. You, you, you're capable, but you know, when you don't feel that sense of efficacy relative to everybody else, you, you know, it, it's sort of a, a, a motivation killer. Whereas you take same students, same credentials, have them go somewhere else where they, again, not that you're with people that like, oh, they can't do their work or whatever, but I am really, I'm, you know, one of the leaders, I, you know, I really feel um, strong in my understanding, my competence, um, you know, others seem to look up to me or, or I just have my peer group. We're all kind of in the same, you know, kind of, I don't know what you would say, sort of just compatible academic um, boat. And that's motivating. You know, what, you know, it's, it's just wonderful snowball reaction in psychology. It's like, the more progress you make, the more you want to make progress, the more you feel good and ready to make progress, the smarter you feel, the more you're excited to apply that and learn more and do more and vice versa. And so there, there is absolutely something to wherever you find yourself, whatever, you know, college campus and peer group you find yourself in, it will have an effect on, on that degree of motivation, your self-concept, your self-esteem. And, and am I going to really, it, it, it's, I, and I think it's a, a more rare person that's going to go, okay, I'm just going to fight to prove that I can do that. That's not kind of typically right. how, how we react. I think it's just much more like, I just got to get through and, you know, hopefully right. I can, you know, hold on here. Um, so again, that, that, that talk kind of shows that, and, and there's some data to support, uh, students who are on the top of their class, um, Definitely, it you know when success is me me measured in terms of publications and things like that, you know there's a, a lot more productivity if you're if you're a big fish in a small yeah. pond. So, if you could send me a link or just help me to yes, get, I've so we'll include that in the show notes too, so you can okay. watch that talk because so much okay. of the thing, so much of what I want to do here is is to not just talk, but for people to really understand and to have a strong foundation. When it comes to this whole college thing, doesn't have to be so stressful and so terrible, and and you don't have to mortgage your life, and and you don't have right. to finance your life away to go to a school that's not going to get you much further than going to your state school and being around. The other thing is there are so many professors who are so talented, so much faculty. This is a so Cynthia. This is something that I, I just love. Um, I, I work at <laughs> many colleges and to work with the staff. And these people are amazing. These people have PhDs. Like after our after our, our, our conversation today, I'm going to be talking to a community college group in Florida. And I'm going to be doing a bunch of events for like their first year students. And the people I'm talking to are like master's degrees, you know, doctorate. They're, these are such qualified people who have probably, and I didn't look at their LinkedIn, I have a pretty good sense. They probably worked at some of these other institutions that people are so eager to get into. But what students and parents don't recognize is when you are going to these other schools that are maybe a little less selective, mm -hmm. the faculty and staff kick ass. Like they're amazing. They're passionate, right? Like you can agree mm -hmm. to this, right? Absolutely. I mean, I started teaching at community college. I had, I had a PhD in psychology. That's and I loved teaching and they got everything, you know, that they would have experienced if I was at a four-year institution. I love how you drop it. You know, 
I, I feel I should have started off talking about your PhD in psychology and yeah. that's not easy. And I'm sorry I didn't start off with, I just know you, yeah. Cynthia. It's like, we have known each other for so many years and that part, like you're so highly qualified and, and I'm, I'm grateful that people have had a chance to get a sense of how you approach this and mm-hmm. how they can reframe this because there are so many options and so many paths and people yes, eat themselves up into a frenzy and then and Cynthia this is something else I need to make sure I hit on before we leave okay so you were saying junior year is when junior year in college is when students who are thinking of going to law school or med school they start applying junior year like explain this to me because I would have been aware of this yeah yeah so um, I can speak more clearly. I think it's a little more, um, probably a little more advanced for medical school. Okay. But the medical school schedule is that first students fill out a um, kind of like a, a universal, kind of a common app for, for medical school, which comes open, opens May 1st of spring. So it would be junior year. And that's when you fill out that that main common application. And what that's going to include, the, the key things that it's going to include, um, MCAT score. So wait, so when you're a junior, you're, junior. you're a junior in college, you will have already taken your MCATs? You should, well, that you're spring, should, yeah, it, it should be, it should ideally be done by May. Like maybe you take the April at the latest. So probably prep. Summer before junior year, you could take one, I think, in September or October of um, junior year, and then I, there's some spring days. I don't know that for sure. Right. But when that main app opens, so here's here's the big picture. Main app, MCAT scores, of course, transcripts to that point. You know, you'll send the, the final spring. Letters of recommendation. So if you're going to have letters of recommendation attached there to send off by June 1st, you've got to have relationships with professors to then, of course, ask them early in that semester. You don't want to ask a professor two weeks. So I'm saying ask professors January, February, meaning you've already developed a relationship with them in, you know, those those first, you know, couple years. So May 1st, you fill out the main application, ideally to submit June 1st mid-June latest because they do have like early round regular and late but you know to to be reviewed first and get the yeah. first shot at um, interviews you got to have early rounds once you submit that and it's been verified I'm not sure what that process is but verified then your individual medical schools come back with round two so that's where they have their own supplemental applications And, oh, I'm sorry, and then that May 1st, that general one is your personal statement. That's that main personal statement. Why do you want to be a doctor? Um, And you got to know. You you know, you really need to know by then. Um, But then, so come mid-June, you're going to get your supplemental essays. Now, this is where you could have still substantial writing. That's where they're going to say, you know, uh, share, you know, some lab research experience that you've had. Tell us about one of your... Uh, you know, clinical experiences, right. et cetera. And so again, the early, you know, submission for that, you really want by August 1st, September. I think the latest you, you want to do is October 1st. That's late because interviews start, I think, mid-October. Right. And they go into, I think, early spring, but that's so you get an interview that happens ideally for right. you in the fall. And then they start doing matches in the spring so that you start the following fall. Wow. So <laughs> I don't want to get people anxious, but no. if if a student is like, whoa, like I want to be a doctor, I don't know any of this, and I don't know how I'm going to be able to do this, is there an opportunity to shift it a year to decide, you know what, I'm going to do all this stuff my senior year as opposed to my junior year, mm-hmm. and maybe take a gap or yes. have that space. Is that an option as well? And do schools look at that favorably or unfavorably? Yes. No, absolutely. So a couple things on that. So first of all, with medical school, um, maturity is, is a key. You know, obviously, if you're going to commit to medical school and they're going to commit to you, 
being mature, so older does not hurt. In fact, one thing I'll, you know, there's a caveat to a lot of these, you know, there are some what are called early college high school programs, you know, where yeah. students can, we've got one here in Texas, and right. students get so excited, I'm going to apply to medical school and I'm 20. And it's like, that. that is not necessarily a comfortable thing for medical school. But if you if you if you wait a year and you do something else, your age is is certainly taken into consideration. More experience, more maturity. There are um, a number of, and I think it's a growing thing, um, what are called post baccalaureate programs, um, and they are it, it, they serve a couple of different purposes. One would be for a student maybe who has been a science major, they want to take a gap year, they want to prepare more. Yeah. And it maybe gives them the opportunity to take some different, more specific science classes that they didn't take before. It also serves a purpose for students that maybe majored um, in a in an area that they had some of the sciences, but now they need to really beef up their science and prep for you know MCAT. So, post baccalaureate program is is out there, and it's usually again a year's worth of classes you're applying while you're doing that. That's all great information. So if someone has specialty, if they want to, if they want to specialize in something, whether it's doing something uh, medical, medical related, or health related, or with law, law school, I would imagine, mm -hmm. is it is that a similar path where you need to do your LSATs like your junior mm -hmm. year? It you know, and and I I have to say I don't I don't have as much uh, knowledge in in LSAT. I will tell you. Students tend to find law school later in the process, you know, whereas there's many more students who going into college, like, I know I want to be a doctor. Um, and that tends to hold. It's it's more rare that students go in knowing for sure or that, you know, students get surprised. They'll say, yeah, I'm just curious. So, you know, junior year, they may say, I'm, I suppose, try the LSAT and see how I do. It's a very different, it's a logical thing. And sometimes if they do well, that inspires them to go into law. Um, again, timing, I don't think it's quite as tight. There's there's maybe not quite as many pieces. I can't be sure of that. But relative to uh, letters of recommendation from professors that you know very, very well, right. the experiences of serving the communities, particularly in law, there are so many of these institutions. Again, having good grades is not enough. Getting a good LSAT grade, they want to see it's, it's a service field, both of these, medicine and law. They're yeah. service professions. And if you haven't been out there giving your time, giving of yourself um, to people who are in need, who need, you know, help and, and finding that compassion um, to, to serve, you know, you're going to have scant, um, you know, to ability to really address and give them, you know, the kind of profile that they're looking for. Right. So, so and you do it because you want to do it, not because you are trying to convince somebody like at this point in your life. <laughs> It should be something that you actually want to do and care about and are invested. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's so yes. important. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a couple more questions, then mm -hmm. wrap up. And I think what we'll do is we'll have to do this again and, and do like a Q and A from the audience and just kind of okay. go through the different aspects because there's just there's just too much to cover. And <laughs> I, I love your perspective. And like the more we talk, I'm like, this is why we talked for two hours the first time. <laughs> We, we talked, right, because I'm so curious, and I know there's so many listeners who are so curious, and you have such wonderful expertise and perspective. So when it comes to when it comes to looking at the costs of college, going to a really expensive school that's going to stretch a family or put a student in a situation where they're going to have a lot of debt as an undergraduate. You know, how do you advise those families? And, and I'm sure you get a lot of families where money probably is less of a, a contributing mm -hmm. factor. But I know also because of your experience working in higher ed for 20 plus years, mm -hmm. you have perspective. So mm -hmm. how, do, how do you view that decision? I view it. Uh, well, it's, 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 it's a really good question. And, and you know, again, full disclosure, I mean, families who hire me typically are, are not those that won't qualify for any aid. They're they're not need based families, but but I I do work with families that like this is our budget. This is it. It's tight. That and and then I have families that will will pay full price anywhere. Um, but you know again, I, I view it a couple different ways. If your student is going into a very concrete field, a STEM field, engineering, computer science. I mean, even you know medicine. I mean. Again, those, those, those disciplines, you know, calculus is the same, whether you learn it at, you know, 
Podunk State School or or Harvard. I mean, it's calculus. You know, you, you code ones and zeros. Ones and zeros is the same. Um, and I'm not trying to equate, you know, professors and there's all different calibers and all of that. But I'm just saying that you're learning a discipline, you're learning a field that is concrete. And, you know, uh, big companies recruit everywhere from everywhere. And so, you know, looking at the value of paying, I'm just going to use numbers roughly to Texas, you know, like 30000 for your state institution or ramping it up to 86000 for the private institution a year, you know, I mean, 56000 a year is, is the the degree of academic experience and undergraduate, you know, life growth potential. Is it really $56,000 a year better? Nice at, and I'm just going to say no. Just, I, you know, I just cannot work, you know, and knowing what I know about undergraduate experiences, students, what colleges provide. And again, usually the more expensive colleges are, are they can charge that, you know, based on their name. And, you know, so... I personally am an advocate for the most financially reasonable yeah. undergraduate degree. That's a good fit for your student. You know, I there are there are students who truly their intellect and personality, their drive. Right. You know, they need a certain school type of school that's going to 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 give them the richness and and peers. And and that might be in a, a private liberal arts school or a private school that that even after scholarship money will will likely be a little more. Right. That this this state school or that state school, um, you know, wouldn't cut it. No, I have to say again, I'm very fortunate here in Texas that you know our top state schools are very rich and they have those programs that that I think could suit anyone. But um, but we I we do look at that balance. And, you know, I, I really just say, especially then if you have students who are going to go into industry after, that they're going to pursue medical school, law school, MBA, or grad school, you know, save your money. Again, it's, it's what they do. And, and where they're going to get likely a less expensive undergraduate education, there's a, a, a big chance they'll be able to develop an undergraduate resume that is much more substantial and can open the doors for right. you know opportunities anywhere and you can save your money for that you right. know um so that's that's kind of how i talk about it they they do what they want to do but right but there is no need you know if you're looking at success and i know there are studies out there i don't have them off the top of my head but there are studies out there that you know investing in a much more expensive name school does not yield necessarily a higher salary over right. the course of a person's career so and you've got uh frank bruni's book uh, oh yeah not who you are then you got um denise pope with challenge success talking about this and our mm -hmm. wallace talked about this most recently mm -hmm. yeah yep. never, never enough and mm -hmm. we're talking about it i talk about it mm -hmm. there, there are so many people who who talk about this and i think that this conversation really shows the value and the experience that a student has and really focusing more on the experience, the people, the places, mm -hmm. what they do, mm -hmm. and that's going to serve them to help them to know what they want to do and, and not do and and then invest that money in a grad program. People who say, oh, Cynthia, I, I get this a lot. Y you know, there's, there's something about the alumni network. There's something about the name, mm -hmm. the prestige, you know, that's going to really take you further. And, you know, my answer to that is, if, if that's important to you, that you go to a grad school that has the name and, yeah. and save your money. Yeah. For, well, I said that we think about it like this. When you, when you, if you need an attorney or you're going to a doctor, do you ever ask where they did their undergraduate work? No, you, you want to know where they went to medical school. Where'd you go to law school? Where'd you go to, you know, medical school? It's your terminal degree that, that really matters if, if you're going to be concerned about name or whatever. Even um, that, how many times do people, they talk to their friends and they say, oh, this doctor is going to be really great. And, and they, and they, do they say, oh, where they go to med school? Right. No, I know it's, it's not, it, it's not. And that's, that's a good point. But um, yeah, so it, it's, you know, free college and university has an alumni network. I mean, that, that's just, it's silly to think what nobody goes to these other schools. Of course they do. It, it's, it's there for the taking. If your student is, you know, 
graduates and is active and connecting on LinkedIn. Yeah. There's more ways. You know, the, the alumni network, there's so many what I call, um, oh, I know I've lost the word, but, you know, there's there's sort of remnants from from pre, you know, internet and social media days, right? I mean, you know, perhaps, you know, in the days of old, you know, the Harvard, you know, alumni network was important because these were people who had the means to travel and connect and meet up and communicate, you know. Now, anybody, you know, again, um, local, state, you, LinkedIn, they've got groups, they've got alumni. It's, you know, we're all connected around the world, every college and university. That's the other thing. You know, they're all intentional about this. You know, every school has their statistics. Every school ha wants to look good for potential new students, for, you know, whatever connections they want to make with, with industry and, you know, their their uh, development office. So they do put effort and money and, you know, intentionality in in developing these elements, you know, for their students. And so, again, name schools, what, what we have been fed is prestige and value here. It is really, it's sort of historic. It just has, it's been around a long time. It's roots, right. it's familiarity. Um, and, and again, the, the smaller schools that, that maybe have only been known um, in, in the local area that are, you know, so incredible and, and valuable, um, it, it just, you know, th they're doing the same things. It's just, you know, they haven't been around as long and not everybody, right. you know, you don't travel to, you know, Paris and see someone in, you know, the local state university sweatshirt, you know? <laughs> but birds everywhere, you know, you'll see that. So it's, it, and in psychology, of course, we, there's definitely, you know, this, what we call, um, you know, just the frequency heuristic, right? It's like the more you see news about it, the name, the more comfortable, the more you think, oh, this is good. This is because you're exposed to it all the time. And, you know, if you don't, you've never heard of it. And again, this is the hardest part of my job is when I have a family and they can see that. And I'm like, well, but, you know, we're, I don't know that your student's going to thrive because a lot of times I'll have a family come and they'll say, Oh, my daughter, you know, she just is so anxious. She's just, she's, she drives herself, she's a perfectionist. She drives herself, you know, kind of, she makes herself sick. And I'm like, and she's applied to all these schools. You know, I'm like, she will, she'll not make it. She, you know, that is not an environment for an anxious student. Um, you know, I we want to find a, a school where she's nurtured. And see, I love, there was this wonderful white paper. This was decades ago. It was written. And just think about it. It flipped thinking about, our university system on its head. Not that it's changed, um, but in schools it has. So it's like, we're set up, so what happens? When you're a freshman in a large state institution or maybe a, a big private school, you, you're much more likely to be taught classes by graduate students, right? Teaching assistants, graduate. You are going to college. You're not exactly sure what you want to study. This is all new. It's a big transition. And who's teaching you? A graduate student that's still a student and working on it and getting there. And then as you work your way up, when you're a junior or senior, then you get to work with tenure track faculty. Well, like, again, I cannot recall the, the details, but, but the author of this paper, who is a longtime educator, said, that's backwards. You know, it's the freshmen that should be taught by our top, you know, most uh, expert, esteemed faculty. They're the ones, you know, we, we need to get to the freshmen and inspire them, connect them with the discipline, Show them, you know, you can, you know, find so much of interest in here. We're going to support you in understanding what this is. You know, when you're junior, senior, okay, then you can learn the information from the grad students that are a few years ahead of you. We haven't, we haven't switched that as a whole, but again, there's so many amazing colleges and universities. And I'm going to do a shout out to the book and the organization, Colleges That Change Lives. Okay. That's a wonderful Again, by Lauren Pope and the organization still goes on. These are institutions. One of the reasons they change lives, and there's many others that that are not officially under that uh, umbrella, but act like them. And this is where the the academic experience is so personalized. You know, your student can go in. The professors are on. You know, they know you by your first name, and you have seminar style classes of fifteen of you for your intro classes. And boy, if you're taking students that aren't really sure what the discipline is or what they want to study or even those students that, that don't know if they're going to be successful in college or they're not sure, 
it's just such a rich, wonderful, nurturing environment to say, you know, as a professor, I would be like, I cannot wait to get you excited about my discipline. Like, you know, I want, I, I love it and I want you to love it. And I, I want to bring you along. And not just as many are in, in much larger institutions or those that don't prioritize freshmen. You know, I'm just going to come in. I have my yellow notes from 35 years ago and I'm going to just want to like, do my thing. I, Can't wait to get back to my lab, you know, and talk to my grad student if you need help. So that, that's a huge, it's a huge part of who's teaching, uh, what do those classes look like? And, and people don't know to ask those questions and don't understand. And, I, and I'm with you. If you're anxious and you, you've you struggled, you want to be in a high-touch environment where mm-hmm. you're surrounded by kind people who are going to be mm-hmm. proactive and, and are going to nurture you and help you and support you and stir your passion, uh, you're not going to do very well having to navigate and advocate and be the one to seek out the people and places. And, you know, those are just those are just really important aspects. And then when it comes to the alumni networks, you know, schools, so many schools have these amazing alumni networks, like you said, and yes, you may not have the same name recognition, but the people who are changing lives, who are innovators and entrepreneurs and running local businesses in those communities who are changing disruptors, who Mm -hmm. these are people who come from a lot of times those communities, those environments, Mm -hmm. and they're, they're exceptional. So people don't recognize that. I'm glad we can point that out. There's one last thing I wanted to ask you before we wrap this conversation up. So an IEC, an independent educational consultant, people have asked me this question. When do I need one? When do I need one? Do I one? And, And I you know, I, I have I have my answer. I think mm-hmm. that there is a lot of value. I think mm-hmm. a lot of times students and families don't start with their schools. They don't mm-hmm. know what their school counselors are capable of, and they mm-hmm. just default to "I'm going to get an IEC." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A lot of value, and, mm-hmm. and it's a huge industry. There's thousands of mm-hmm. IECs. But in your in your words, Cynthia, when someone is asking the question, "Do I need an IEC?" Mm-hmm. How do you answer that? There's a lot packed in there. But I will just say this. I mean, first of all, yes, I I absolutely encourage everyone to um, kind of check out what, you know, even middle schoolers. I I spoke at a a middle school a couple months ago, middle school, you know, for eighth graders. and, And it was a packed house because there's just a lot of, there's a lot of panic and concern, right, about, you know, and, and intimidation behind being competitive for college. And, and there's a, so much misinformation out there. So the first thing I do want to share is, you know, certainly get on the high school, local high schools website. There's usually a page for counselors. See what information is there. You know, talk to others about not the college piece, but what the process of the counselor. Get a feel for it. Now, I will say a lot of, you know, a lot of counselors at big public high schools and even some of the private high schools. I work with students at, at all schools. You know, they have a particular role at the school. And typically it involves much more for especially public high schools, much more than guiding juniors and seniors through this process. They have so many other responsibilities that that the amount of time they have and their capacity for even professional development is, is just slim. Uh, it's just part of their packed job and and they just cannot do more than than the little they're able to do um and and so that that really if you just feel you have you know a a counseling uh office that everyone has a huge caseload it's not personal it's hard for your student to get in obviously um and that that you have a lot of questions your student you know has um you know excitement about college You, you need lists and things like that um, so again, kudos to to all school counselors. It's just sometimes they don't have the the bandwidth to do this. The other piece of it too, and and you know, part of my value. There's so many different levels of this. Um, what I what I bring, like we talked about, not being the parent, um, is helpful. But you know, as an independent, you know, a big part of my job that I love is traveling to colleges across the country. I get on campus. I I learn 
what the students are like there, what opportunities are happening. And and a lot of times it's it's more than what parents and families get. They'll they'll present to us and it's really rich. And I get so excited to come back to my students, you know, those especially who might say, I, I don't want to go to school in this state. I want to get out. Or parents that say, well, we can only afford in state. And I'll say, oh, but I know of scholarships, you know, your student is in line for. So bringing that piece of um, certainly educating them on school options. This is, you know, kind of a theme of what we've been talking about. So many options out there. And a lot of times people use that verbiage. I just want my student to go to a good school. And it's like, I know what their definition is, is probably very different than mine. And I, I love the education piece. I'm an educator at heart, right? So it is ideally if they'll listen, you know, here's what the undergraduate experience should be. Here's what we want to look for. Here's what, you know, your student can accomplish. All these amazing schools that you can afford is close by or what whatever checks their boxes. So the opportunities and the options for students are much broader than you probably think. But I would say, you know, one of the most important elements of what I do is give families and students um, a true understanding of, of all the elements and peace of mind, you know, peace of mind, because if you can only see your, your school counselor briefly, they can talk to you about the local state schools. Um, you know, they just don't, again, they don't have the time, but you're hearing from classmates and peers, the parent grapevine, I think should be worse than what the students yeah. are hearing. And, and so one of my, I, I think most important roles that I play in addition to the logistics of helping the student understand how to tell their high school story to the colleges. I mean, that's really what the bulk of my work is. You know, you have this amazing story from your three years in high school so far and what your goals are and your dreams and who you are and whether you know what major or not, or can it just tell this wonderful story in a way that colleges are going to find meaningful and appreciate. But that other piece of this, this can be exciting. It can be positive and it should it does not have to be stressful. It does not have to be, we're crossing everything to hope that these few schools will take my child so that they can go to a good school. You know, it's it's helping them, again, if you're open and willing and want to, to hear it, how, again, regardless of where your student gets in, what their opportunities ultimately are, they are going to be able to thrive and, and be su just as successful as they want and can be. And and really helping them find that comfort in, in knowing their student's going to be successful. I appreciate that. And I think there's so much value. And you're, I mean, you're exceptional. And you, know, you see students and you you work one-on-one. -on -one and mm -hmm. I know that, um, you know, I'd hope to, I hope to help other people to learn from you. And we'll find ways to do that. I encourage anyone who has questions about college, the college process, IECs, waitlist, deferred, whatever it is, <laughs> um, use the comments here. Uh, we'll mm -hmm. check out these comments and I'm going to use these comments as a way to also uh, bring up some questions. We'll, we'll do this. We'll do more of this because there's so there's so much that we need to address. And uh, gosh, there's there's one thing real quickly, like a, <laughs> like in, 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 in as quickly as possible. Okay. Uh, a parent or student, a parent who says, I'm not sure if my kid is ready for college. You know, uh, I just don't know. What are some signs? What are some things that you've seen that would indicate, you know, maybe this kid needs a gap year. Maybe they need to go mm -hmm. to a local school for a little bit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you have just a few of those things that you can just share? I would certainly say, um, you know, if, if parents are finding that that their student just does not kind of own their their role as a student. You know, they, it, they you know, hopefully they've tried and they're not just, you know, saying this because, you know, they're always poking them. Have you done your homework? You need to do your homework. I, I'll take your phone until you're home. Like, you know, if, if they feel at, at, you know, the later years in high school, you are having to manage, remind, make sure that your student is doing everything and, and beyond school as well. You know, did you put gas in your car? Did you do, I mean, because if, if a student isn't showing signs of, of independently navigating the, the elements of life that are important, yeah. I would be very nervous to let them go off to college where they're not going to have those reminders. 
Um, I, I mean, I just think that's a big sign. And, and I ask my parents, when I start with a new family, I say, how ready do you think? But I would say that that level of independence, ownership, um, and relative to college in particular, ownership of school. And do they like school? Or do they? Can they speak to a favorite class or a class they like the best and why? I mean, I've had students sit in my office and they can't answer that. And I think it doesn't matter how many A's or B's you have. If you can't speak to what what classes you like and why, there's, there's just a really, um, I think there's a void there relative to connecting with being, you know, educated and, and pursuing higher education. Yeah. I, I do a whole thing uh, where I help students to exercise their want muscle because so much of education and life is about doing what everybody else wants them to do mm -hmm. that they struggle. This one student told me, yeah, I don't know how to want because everyone's told me what I should want. And I think that's mm -hmm. such a fascinating reflection mm -hmm. on education. And we're so busy focusing on being wanted so we can get into the best school and have the best life that the actual exercise of reflection and understanding what it means to want and why we want is something that a lot of people struggle with, but you're, you're great at helping people to do that. And our conversations, I mean, we went, we went longer than I was anticipating. I think we probably could have gone another, I, <laughs> I could talk to you another hour. Um, we will do, we will do this as a, as a, to be continued. I could talk to you forever. Uh, if people want to get a hold of you, if they mm -hmm. have questions, if they're interested in reaching out, what is the best way for someone to mm -hmm. get a hold of you, Cynthia? So I would say the best way would be my website, which is just www.cynthiajenkinsconsulting.com. And there's my email addresses in there. There's an inquiry form. You can just read more about my background, what I do. Um, but I would say that's that's probably the best way. And um, I, I have to, while I have the floor here, I just, I have to plug Farlin as being as exceptional, inspirational, and amazing as he keeps saying I am. Um, you know, this man just, he truly has a service heart for students and, and their well being in particular, and always an inspiration, always full of ideas. I can't keep up when we meet to brainstorm. It's like, wait a minute, he's left me in the dust because, well, we could do this, we could do this. And I love thinking that way, but he's, you know, 80 miles an hour to my 20. But it, it's just always, um, you know, I, I just, I love your, the genuine um, way that you approach helping students. And I, again, I think, I like to think that's how we connect. Yeah. Well, thanks. I always have a hard time listening to, to nice things. <laughs> I know, and people, they'd be like, I know, it's like the hardest part of what I do. I'm like, oh, this is so <laughs> nice. But I have a hard time hearing that. It's, it's the whole, you know, we, we both want people to be so successful and uh, the information that we share, I think, I think it really does serve. And mm -hmm. I'm going to keep doing more, and and we'll keep doing more because okay. I am so excited to, I'm so excited to be able to have a place to be able to share our conversations with other people who can benefit. And you are equally as engaged and and mission oriented. And uh, sadly, I think things are getting not better but worse in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And I want to be part of that change. And you you do as well. And I think that through all the people who were able to talk to and be able to to share this with and people who I'm able to to highlight uh, really making a change. You know, I think we can make a change. I know we can mm -hmm. make a change. I mm -hmm. know we can make this better. I know, I can see ways. And uh, that's, that's the idea, every breath, just to figure out a way to make things a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm excited for that. And I'm excited to have you in our corner and yeah. uh, this has been a blast. So thanks, yeah. Cynthia Jenkins. You are fantastic. And I'm going to I'm gonna end this way. And a lot of our conversations, we're going to do it to be continued, okay? Okay. That sounds perfect. Thank you so much for having me and, and giving me the opportunity to share. Thanks, Cynthia. All right. Thank you, Arvin.